There we go. So why science LLC? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the American and, and North American, generally speaking, company and business uh, organization styles, but it basically means GmbH here in Germany. It's a limited liability yeah, company. So it means that whenever you F up, they cannot come after you. Yeah? They can only sue the company. And, 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 and liable is basically, it's a quality or a state. Yeah? You're, you're responsible, basically. And why do I say Science LLC and why I'm here today? Actually, because I don't think that we are doing science anymore for the sake of doing science. We're not in academia anymore where we want to push the boundaries of what we know and what we don't know. It, we, it has become more like a wheel on a car. It just keeps turning and churning out scholars and people and more funds needed and not much material to it. And what's interesting is that if you look at it, and you know, I believe that academia has really lost its taste. And it's not the way uh, you can read about professors talking with Einstein, for example, and, and you, will, you will hear that they truly cared about their students. They, yeah, there are many times they have talked uh, and they have, uh, with, with, a, with a associate professors, they, let's say, next to them, and, and their conversation's been around students. Yes, they talk science, but they also talk how do they teach what they know, right? So it and, and really changes your world view because you want to know, am I really here to learn, right? So in a sense, I am breaking it down to three categories. Let's say we're going to talk about the system, we're going to talk about the leadership, and we're going to talk about ourselves. So just out of curiosity, how many people here are have bachelor degree? Just show of hands. Don't worry, I will not report it. All right, how about masters? Okay, how about PhDs? Really? That's a good sign. That's a really good sign. So, so we, we, we want to see where is it that, what is it that pushed you to go into, let's say, going into your PhDs, or why are you doing a postdoc, or why are you doing masters? Why are you even doing bachelor's degree, right? So let's look at the system. Let's look at the system that teaches bachelors. Let's look at the system that also teaches the master's people the same way. So how do universities or academia operate? Who knows? Put your hand up, yell out, yell it out. How does it work? Does anyone know? Like if you just know how it works, put your hand up, like for the love of God. Someone put your hand up. Because you went to university, you better know how that works. So, anyone? You don't know how universities work and you went there. All right, so this is how universities work. It's it's basically it's basically business, right? So you have to keep the lights on, you have to have people work there, right? You have to have students. Otherwise, it will just be a weird place where people hang out and talk about their ideas. Actually, those weird places are called institutes. Um, so, so, so here, what you're seeing, what you're seeing here, um, are these these heads that have nuclear structure in it? Is these are your your researchers, your professors, you call them, right? What you see next after that, these are your. This is data. What is data? That is like what people research, they find new things, and then they tell the world about it. They're like, okay, world, I found A, B, C, and now someone is gonna be cured, right? But then what happens is that based on this track record, they can actually get more money. And then that money, you follow the money, goes back to the researcher to do more of this. But also there is a kickback, just like in mob, in mob movies. The university will take that money, will pay for your electricity bill, will pay for your internet connection, your phone, um, sometimes your clothes, and this circle will continue, okay? So why do we follow the money? Because, well, it's the 21st century, we're mostly in capitalist system, um, and if you do follow the money, then you wanna know, well, what kind of people do universities need? So what do you think? Do they need good teachers or good researchers? Both. Who said both? Me. 
Yes, you're right, exactly. So you want both, but that doesn't happen. Uh, so which ones? Realistically speaking, what does the university need right now to operate? Researchers or teachers? Researchers, it's common sense. You need the researchers. So, did you say account? <laughs> true, that's also true. Um, so exactly, so they need researchers because they need to keep this circle going. Right? So once you understand this, I think you start to really making sense around what's happening. So when you go to your bachelor level course and you might see your professor a little bit stressed or whatever, then you will be like, ah, actually I'm not the reason he's stressed. Well, there's a lot of stuff happening in the background that, that might cause this stress. But I believe that this system, this really churning out, this, this circular system has really driven the word, the meaning of the word academia out of it, out of it, yeah? So the regular meaning to it is that it's relating to or associated with an academy or school, especially of higher learning, okay? But how do you define learning? But then I just go to the dictionary because my English is not so good. So it says something like to gain knowledge or new skill or, yeah, so it's common sense stuff, so we, we, we get it. But how does this really tie into those people that are involved in the, in the chart that I showed you earlier, where there is researcher, there is money, there's uh, go back, money goes back and it starts all over again. So we want to look at how do these people, or how could they affect the system that they're in? So I am hiring that, that piece of rock over there. Uh, you don't want to know what my son thought that was. Um, let's say that's a skill. It's a method. It's, it's something that, that the researcher does. You bring them in, and they will, of course, need help to perform the experiments or read books and go to the libraries and do all that work. And the idea is that you teach them this skill. You teach them the skill. But a lot of people mistake teaching the skill with being told what to do. Those two things are not the same. You can teach someone to think for their own, which is what you want to do, which is where you see this mutation happening. What it actually says up there with, with these lamps is that knowledge mutates, knowledge evolves. So when you pass it on to your students, to your followers, to your trainees, what they do is that they evolve it. And from this evolution, one of the reasons we all don't look the same, this evolution allows for higher probability of finding something. It's, it's like asking people to go look for your wife that's missing, if anyone still does that. You can, you can you, and they all start looking in the same place. You tell them, no, you gotta go look somewhere else. Well, why are we looking in the same place? So, but what happens is that, well, that, that mutation, that evolution, that evolution drives new discoveries. And make no mistake and don't let anyone tell you otherwise because that, is, that cannot work. That never ever works. So, what are the problem areas then? Why are we even talking about this right now? Well, the problem is that there are a lot of, there's a lot of stress put on the researcher. There's a lot of expectation from the researcher to perform. Now you tell me, how is it that when you're searching for something, you're, let's say you're doing research on something you don't know, it exists or not, how can that be used, the end result, be used as a metric? It's like me telling you, go in the desert and bring me water. You know what I mean? It's, is it probable? Yes. And if you put your mind to it, can you find it? Yes. But is it the best thing to do? No, right? It's not the best thing to do. So, but if you put all these stresses on the researchers, what happens usually, then this pressure to publish, pressure to, to, to produce, it leads to also fear of loss of livelihood, so they might lose their jobs. And there are a lot of postdocs, for example, they don't have permanent contracts, as you refer to them in Germany. 
they don't have permanent contracts, so if they don't perform well, and remember the metric is the, are the findings, right? If they don't perform well, they, they can lose their livelihood. So imagine just have that in the back of your mind that you might lose your income, yeah? But also, in this fear could be because of Yes. True, and, and so this, this you can also apply anywhere where there is some kind of a metric put and, and a pressure put, right? So, so this is why most of these things that we talk today, these are, I haven't invented them, I have just read a couple of books and kind of looked at the situation and be like, eh, you know, this, this shouldn't be like that. So yeah, you can apply it in pretty much, you can also apply these principles at home, like with a, with a family. Uh, my two-year-old or four-year-old don't agree with me much, so, you know, it happens. So, so what I'm trying to say is that these kind of stresses put on the researcher starts to corrupt the, the, the transfer of knowledge. What happens when you are about to be in an accident? You see the car driving at you, and he's not slowing down. What do you do? What, you, you panic. Hopefully you do something after that. What do, what do you do after that? <coughs> you, you, you rely on your instincts, right? You rely on your instinct to protect yourself, right? So when you rely on your instincts and you go back to this very primary way of operating, what you're telling people is not anymore do evolve your knowledge that I gave you. What happens is that you're telling them, do as I told you because I know that works. If you ever hear anyone tell you, do as I told you because I know that works, hasn't understood the concept of hiring a person, right? If you don't need my brain, you don't need me. And you don't need a brain to repeat what you're doing, like what you, what, what, what you tell people to, to do. So, once that happens, well, now you, you will understand, the, and maybe the masters and bachelor students here, you, or, the, or the degree people, you will understand how does this affect you. So I don't know the total spending on, on research in Germany, but I'm assuming it's in billions. Uh, Mario, would that sound about right? Yes. It's in billions. So imagine that in US, it's like 18 billion, 18 billion or 20 billion dollars. So of those, and you can, I didn't put any citations here because it's silly, you, you just Google this and it will come up. 20-30% um, of the work that's published cannot be reproduced. So they're fake. Well, they're not fake, but they're done in a way that they're not really reliable. So imagine for 20-30 years, multiply that by whatever amount of money that was spent, and you already understand that this is close, getting over $100 billion just in US. Just imagine all that money and 20% of it is just trash. Trash. And with that money, you could have done a lot. But because you put this pressure on the people and unrealistic expectations, they drive you to this result. Classic humanity in both things. So as hard as it sounds, what you have to do at a leadership level, no matter what happens, you have to protect your people. You have to protect them from outside pressures because if you don't, which what's happening is that your, your pressure, is, the pressure that's on you is leaking through you and onto them. And unlike you, they don't know how to handle it. And because they don't know how to handle it, if you have any friends that are doing their PhDs or their postdocs, you will hear horror stories. It, it ranges anywhere from as bad as suicide all the way to, I don't wanna do this anymore. And they just leave science and start a bakery, which is probably the best way to go. Um, so so protect, uh, uh, today's, today's topic is not just to talk about everything that we might do, but it's just to raise awareness about what's really going on in the background.
So, but there are also internal pressures. So you have outside pressures, like you have to publish, you have to do this, you have to teach. Um, but you also have um, internal pressures. Please let the burgers in. So, so there, there are of course many, many things that you can do, but we just, let's just talk about one of them. And of course you can apply this, Geo, as you mentioned, you can apply this in business also, right? So a lot of people think that when they do their research that the bigger picture is only available to the researcher himself, so professor. I know where all the projects are going and I tell the people to drive the projects in that direction. But how it should be really is this, where you are steering the boat but different parts of the boat are operated by the brains that you have hired. And you know that, of course, you know, on the boat, you know, one guy can control turning. I have no idea about boating, by the way. I'm really out there. <laughs> I'm assuming that it's one guy and a steering wheel, but, but there, are, there are many other guys that are maintaining the boat, feeding you and catching fish, and you know, something like that. So, so, so the idea is that you, you have to let them drive the research. And I have experienced all, all of the things that I'm talking to, to today, and I can tell you that the difference in speed that you will go from producing results, and I mean not that you're measuring that, but you, you see actual results of your work is when you let your people do the work. Let them use their brains, let them evolve the knowledge you have given them, right? So, talk last, I, 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 I said this during my TED talk, and I, I always say this, and I, when I have a meeting with the PhD students and, 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 and technicians, I always try to speak last, because I just wanna know, let them say what they need to say. As soon as you open your mouth, you change everyone's mind. As soon as you speak, you change their mind. So you, you start making them bias. Bias to say something that you would like, right? So if I will say, hey, how are the, how's the work going with the patient samples? They might be biased now to speak positively and not to tell me the bad things that are happening or the mistakes that they're making, right? So I wait, they speak, they sometimes come up with the problems, sometimes they will solve it right there themselves. No need to speak. Even better. Trust and respect. And these are needless to say that without it, people don't feel human. If I don't trust someone, I don't respect someone, well, they will not feel a connection to you. And if they don't feel connection to you, they're not gonna open up to you to learn from you or to allow you to learn from them goes both ways. So, now moving to trainees. Now, if you talk to PhDs and postdocs, and they will always tell you that, well, it's long hours, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, I don't wanna work, I don't wanna do this for, for, for the rest of my life, and it's all true. It is true, it's a lot of work, but there's a reason for that. <laughs> the reason is not that, you know, you just have to keep churning uh, uh, methods that you were told to do over and over again, that's boring. Anyone who does repetitive work and is not satisfied but by seeing the results of their own brain's child will complain. I haven't seen anyone who likes like video gaming complain that they video game for eight hours. True? Is it true? Who likes video game? Actually, you have that video game. <laughs> so let's let's talk about them. So the, so the most important question, um, and, and and we recently were we were interviewing postdocs and PhD students. I just asked them straight on, why are you here? Why are you doing this? Why do you want to do a PhD? What, what what what's the point? What is it that we're missing that you need to fill in for? The thing is, I already know the answer. I know that this person is unique because this, this person is standing in front of me and he's not me. I know that. And, I, but I, I want them to know that. I want them to understand that you are the unique, 
you bring your uniqueness, you bring your, your way of thinking, and your entire life's experience shapes that. And this is where you start getting into the areas of diversity and inclusion. Remember that humanity has always come up with patch, patchwork. They always come up with a patchwork. Whenever there is something missing and people complain, they come up with some term in order to make it sound like we're addressing it. Diversity and inclusion. It's like me coming in front of you today and saying that I did not rob a bank on my way here. I did not beat a child. Why would you say that? Why would you willingly go in front of someone and say, I didn't rob a bank. If you go to the cops right now, if you go to the police and say, I did not rob a bank, they will say, come inside. We need to talk to you. Yeah? And it's like saying the same thing. Whenever, uh, and, and Mario is one of this, when you write a brand, you have to have some kind of a diversity and inclusion statement that I will not discriminate based on someone's skin color or sexual orientation or nationality or the language. But, but I will not discriminate. Why would I say that if I am a person who doesn't do this? Yeah. So, we patchwork it. Want to say something? No? You don't have anything to say? You look like you have something to say. <laughs> Your beard looks like better than mine, but you could say that. So what I did was, um, earlier, like three people put their hand up that they have PhDs. Who were? One, two, oh, oh uh, now, uh, hey, she, did you put your hand up? Do you have a PhD? <laughs> uh, Not yet. No. Um, so I asked this on Twitter just just to say, um, and I'm not famous on Twitter or anything, so I didn't get so many responses, but like 140 or 150 responses. The important thing is to understand what's going on in people's minds, right? So I asked them, what made you pursue your doctoral studies? So I'm now I'm going to ask you, uh, you're smiling for some reason, tell me, what made you follow your, remember, don't say your name. It let me... Michael. I'm Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an addict. <laughs> <laughs> That's a two-step. <laughs> it let me dig myself a rabbit hole and just go and do what I found interesting for four or five years. All right. Yeah. Well, well, gave me freedom. So, interest. Interest in doing science. Good work, life balance. Do you want to say something, even in a big way? No, I, apparently I don't have a PhD. Okay, so there you go. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. Please be quiet. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> she's she's going to kick me later. I don't even know her, actually. Uh, who was it else? Did you? Yeah. What? Um, same answer, impressed. Yeah, so like yeah. you love doing science? Yeah. Uh, that's weird people. <laughs> Next. Thank you. Anyone else? Same interest. Interest? Anyone else? Like, did you do it? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, why did you start it? Um, okay, so you want to do you did it for money? Yes, and later also to find some jobs. Okay, so just remember the answers that you hear, okay? Anyone else with a PhD that wants to say, oh, yeah. I'm also finishing it, but I thought it would also be a good way to travel the world a little bit. It's an easy profession to do that. Some experiences. Travel the world? <laughs> I'm not from here. Where are you from? Portugal. Portugal, all right. Not from Portugal. That's great. Thank you. Uh, who else? Who else wants to say why? Please go ahead. I'm a biologist, and everybody told me that I have to do my PhD to find a job. Exactly. Please remember the answers. So that that's exactly. Let's see what the results are. Ah, oh, look at that. So 77 percent of 146 responses. I'm not famous. I told you. Uh, they said they, they they did it because they love to do science. And 16% said could not find a job. He's right there. Uh, everyone else did it. Some people said, well, everyone else did it, so I did it. And it's kind of there. Uh, she's right there. So, so, can you spot the PhD? Let's do this. This is the next one. Come on. Which one has a PhD? Rajesh. <laughs> this is why they have diversity and inclusion statements. <laughs> Which one of these has PhD? Not a, 
This is why I love putting a lot of people like this minded people in the same room. The answers. That's it? Any more ideas? Because I'm, I'm about to reveal the answer. I actually don't know. This is, a, this is a stock image. So what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't really matter. You know, a lot of people hear that you're going to do your doctorate and you're going to be like, everyone's going to call me doctor. No one gives a shit. I, I, I really mean it. That no one cares because nothing really changes. The only place it matters is like when you're writing a grant and it's on the paper. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter. So you, you don't worry about doing a PhD because, you know, it's, it's a money. I'm sure you can make more money somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, there are other things. So, where does all this disappointment come from? So, like, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of disappointment in academia. Um, I don't know most of you, but where do you think disappointment comes from? What? Hold on, hold on. Let me go back to the PhDs because I will also ask the masters. Um, poor supervision. What? Poor supervision. Poor supervision. All right. And working for something for one year or something, and then it works out, but it's not the solution for your problem. He said nothing. No, he said he said that you work hard for a long time and it, it doesn't work no, out or it, it works, works out. It can work out, but it's not the solution for thesis. Exactly. Yeah, it happens. That's that's research. That happens. What where else does the disappointment come from? Funding. Yes sir. Funding. Funding, so no one gives you money. That's okay. I think like usually people don't just hand out money, so that's normal, no? I actually understand exactly what he means. Um, writing grants and not getting the money is like getting hit in the groin. It's just bad. It just feels bad. What else? Expectations what else? are not being met. Expectations are not being met. We all come in this, in this career because we all have this lofty goal of making nice, great science, and then the reality is completely the opposite. But he actually started a pretty good thing, so let's put that on the pause. Why do you think that what you're doing is not great? I do think what I'm doing is great. I think the method which we go around it is sometimes not so great. Uh, Even though can we you clarify what do you want to say about method? What do you mean by I method? The method of producing science, publishing it, communicating it, has lots of nitty gritty things that we're supposed to kind of ignore while still em embellishing this great grandeur of the scholar that that's a science. That's you're absolutely you're, no. You're absolutely right, and I, I absolutely agree with you. And I hope that um, in your path, in the future path, that you take this theory and not just theory, actually your experience with you, and you work against it. I hope you. I really hope that you do that, and you too. So let's look at what people said. All right, this is the interesting. So I asked which component of your current PhD or your postdoc, whatever, you would like to change ASAP. So right away. Gun to your head, what is it? What do you think people said? Fast. If, and anyone can answer. Is it a human factor? Is it the funding? Is it, what is it? Human. 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 Who said that? Did you, did you say the human? <laughs> he's, he's too active. Uh, someone else? Biologist? What do you think? think? What do you think they would change? What? Field of research. All right, all right, all right, all right. <coughs> We're getting there. What else? You want to say something? We agree we would like our we. we would agree that our supervisor should talk less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, she's still on the slide number fifteen. We'll get Okay, what else? Anyone any takers? I have like fourteen minutes left. You better like hurry up. Stability and security, political answer because your boss is right behind you. Um, so this is what they said. They said I wanna change the project. 35% said the PI, and PI here stands for the professor or, or the researcher or whatever. Some people said peers, that's, that's actually sad. And the committee members, committee I understand. PI I also understand. Project, it happens, right? Like no one asks for it, 
usually you go through these waves of findings and Mario can actually support me on this so many times. I was hitting walls so many times, so many times, but he was good at pulling me back from hitting the wall and be like, hey, relax, you'll, you'll find a way. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm glad that I did. So a lot of people thought that it's the, it's the, it's the human factor, so it's the PI. So I asked, I, I dig more. I dig more and I say, all right, what do you think drives your supervisors or PIs bad leadership practices? Because they don't get leadership training. Because they, they don't do the research. I love that. Please. Every everyone in 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 a company, if he wants to go to a higher position, he needs to do an assessment center. He gets leadership training days in the HR department that doesn't exist at university even. The, Diversity Inclusion Board doesn't tell because my PI is the person in charge of my life for the next three years. Um, I'm not complaining about anything. <laughs> 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 That's my PhD on the line. If I she's like, it's all shit. <laughs> I love mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I can't complain because because that person is in charge of sending me my PhD. You are dependent on that Is person. that person here? No. Okay. <laughs> no is that the fine. person? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what was interesting to me is to, 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 to see, to, to kind of identify what, what are we blaming, right? what is it that we don't like, right? And I asked, do you think that it's the pressures of work? or no leadership training or personal character. And it really took me by surprise because I really thought that people will say no leadership training because they're actually correct. So if you've seen my TED talk, you, I cited there a nature paper where, where they did a survey over 3,000 scientists and academicians. And when I say science, by the way, it doesn't just mean like life sciences or physics, philosophy, literature. They exist, right? <laughs> okay. So like it, it, it stretches to everything, right? And it really took me by surprise because people blame the personal character. So they say you're a shitty person. And I can understand that. I can understand why they say that. Why do you think they say that? Why, when, when is it that you blame another person for being a shitty person? No, no, Gio, why, why would I say to someone, you're a shitty person? Like, what does he have to do to me in order for me to really think that his personal character is compromised? Not treat you the way you expect to be treated. I think Go the deeper. I think without empathy. Yeah. Go deeper. Just, just say it. Do not respect. Just say it. You guys are talking symptoms. They You're saying symptoms. You. Oh, no respect or no trust. This is all bullshit. Just say it. Because you're hurt. Because you're hurt. Because you've emotionally been hurt. And the first thing you do, because you look at that person and you say that, well, you're a shitty person because you hurt my feelings. You hurt me emotionally. Why do you, what, if I would walk up to you and say you're a shitty person, would you get hurt? Oh. But why do you get hurt? if it, it's done by your professor? I don't know, have a certain set of expectations from the person and then they don't... True. What else? Because you, you seem as a higher person. You see what? You trust his um, point of view. Say it louder so they can hear. You trust him and you see that he's a higher position. Because you trust him. Because in order to learn, you came to him and you said, teach me. You said, I look at you like you're a fucking God. And I trust you, I believe in you that you will do what's best for me. And the first sign of bad leadership practices, let's just put an umbrella on that, just call it all that, you take it emotionally. I've seen people cry in the bathroom. In this very university, 
not further than 200 meters from where we're standing right now. And I didn't say a person crying in the bathroom. I'm saying people crying in the bathroom. I'm not saying a girl was crying in the bathroom. I'm saying people were crying in the bathroom. It's shitty. We have to open ourselves up to people so we can learn from them. And we come to the university where we trust that the university has our back and we open up, but then we are shut down. And the first thing we, that comes to our mind is, you're a shitty person. Not that you have no leadership training, you're a shitty person. Understanding what you're dealing with is like 80%. I, I, I think someone else said this, like Socrates or something, I don't know. Uh, someone said this, I don't want to steal it, so I didn't come up with this idea, I'm just saying that I heard it somewhere, someone say that understanding the issue, understanding the problem is like a big component of being able to deal with it. And I just wanted people to know, the masters people, bachelors people, people with no education that want to go into education, I want you to know that this is how the system works. This is what makes people act in a certain way. And this has no reflection upon you, how smart you are or how unique you are or how good you are. Unfortunately, I, I'm not strong enough to go and pull the ears of the people who are responsible for this and flick my finger and it happens. But I do have the power to say yes to Gio, to come out here, to talk to you. I do have the power to go on the TED stage and tell you about it because I want you to feel like you are somebody and that nobody, not even at universities, people that don't know the difference between two leadership related books. Did you know there's a leadership related book like in Greco Roman and even before that, like 2000 years before Christ? Like, the philosophers talked about this. I was reading this and I was like, I don't understand it. But it sounds like they knew this problem would exist. And because you understand these issues, it allows you to go to the person and say, look man, I opened up to you to learn from you, but you're letting me down. It's very hard for me to say this to you, but you're letting me down. I don't know what to do, I'm blind. What is the other word for when you can't hear? Death. Death, thank you. This is what the stage does to you, yeah? And I put myself in this position. <coughs> Embarrassing myself here. Yeah. So until we gonna decouple the money from teaching, this is not gonna be fixed. I'm not standing here pretending like I'm some kind of a ministerium level person who can enact laws. I'm just saying that I, I think I'm smart enough to see that this cannot work. And people will seek out this training. They will look for the training when they see that it matters. You know, if you would actually stay and cry in the room of your professor or boss or whatever it is, they would be least, less likely to repeat that behavior. If, you know, they're not a shitty person. But it's your dignity. So you don't have to do that. That's not the way to deal with this problem. And a reminder to academia, and I don't know who is here involved in what positions, where do you work, what you do, and how you do it. Um, but it's not limited in its liability, like the companies are. So I want to thank you for really engaging with me in this um, in this talk. And please tell me about your stories. Follow me in all of this, whatever this is. And thank you so much. One more time.